Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In Nicomachean Ethics Book 10, Aristotle finally delivers on a promise that he made all the way at the beginning of the work in Nicomachean Ethics Book 1, that is to talk about the contemplative or the theoretike life, the life that involves theoria, which means uh, looking upon, contemplating, thinking about, uh, all, all these sorts of things are sort of rolled up in it. And it comes originally from, from a term that means to, to look upon something as in going to a spectacle. But it comes to take on the sense very quickly of intellectual life, the life that engages the, as Aristotle puts it, the highest part of ourselves. And so what we're interested in finding out here is, well, what is the life of contemplation and what is its value? So Aristotle says that it is the best and the happiest life. It is the life of happiness to a greater degree, even more than the life of happiness that he's been discussing throughout the rest of the Nicomachean Ethics, which is the life of activity, that, that derives from virtue, the active exercise and development of the virtues, what we might call the political or the social or the active life. Uh, he's, he's saying here that that's really great and this is even better. This is the highest form of life possible. Um, in, in the Nicomachean Ethics, he explicitly identifies it with philosophia, with, with philosophy, as the pursuit of wisdom, that is Sophia, that, that intellectual virtue that you, we've done another video about that you can check out. So for humans and for the gods, this is the best and highest form of activity. In fact, Aristotle suggests that the gods um, don't even have a choice about this. They're not going to be involved in the active life. They are just going to be involved in the life of contemplation. So why is this the best life? These are all the reasons that Aristotle provides and considers. The first is that he says that it is the highest form of activity, the highest form of energia, of doing things that, that human beings can do. Um, why is it the highest form of activity? There's, there's two reasons. One has to do with the faculty that is engaged in it. That is the part of our soul, the part of our personality, our makeup. And that is the intellect. Our cognitive side, you could say, is what is, is doing all of the work, uh, not our body, not our feelings, not our drives, except perhaps for a drive for, for truth or a drive for, for understanding. So there's the faculty. And then there is the object of that faculty. What is it that the person is contemplating? They're not just picking up a piece of chalk and, and staring at it all day long. It isn't that sort of contemplation. Nor is it mere navel gazing, as we say, you know, self-reflexive mind thinking about itself. Although we saw, we'll say in the metaphysics, mind thinking itself is, is at least as far as God goes, is, is that. But human beings aren't really capable of, of doing that sort of contemplation. What are we contemplating? We're contemplating uh, the things that are, you know, of necessity, the things that we can have knowledge about, the things that remain the same or at least in their changes follow certain fixed principles, the things that we can occupy our minds with. So in a certain way, it's the scientific life, although very different than the, the science that we think of today in many respects. What else? 
Um, Aristotle says that intellectual work of this sort, for the people that actually have cultivated their intellects, not for everybody uh, necessarily, but those who really are you know, engaged in this, who have developed what we call intellectual virtues, this sort of activity provides the greatest, the purest, that is at least mixed in with pains, and the most lasting pleasure. Aristotle thinks that most of the pleasures that we feel are not sustainable for very long. And if you think about examples, um, you know, how long can you um, taste particularly good food? Even by the end of the dish, it doesn't actually taste the same. You know, as Henry Miller once, once said in one of his books, I don't remember which one, um, why is it that we work? Well, it's, it's something we can actually do for eight hours a day and not become totally sick of, whereas try to you know, have sex for eight hours a day or eat fine food eight hours a day. Maybe you might be able to do it the first day, but uh, you're not going to be able to keep it up. And so this is, in fact, something that you can keep up eight, 16 hours a day once you've become uh, you know, versed in how, how to do it. So we're able to have the, the greatest, the longest, the most pure pleasure from contemplation. Um, it's also, as Aristotle says, a life of greater self-sufficiency than the active life of the virtues. And here he has in mind you know, what we might call the social or, or political life, where you need some resources in order to exercise certain of the virtues. It's hard to be generous if you don't have any wealth to be generous with, let alone magnificent, which is generosity on a larger scale. It's difficult to be uh, to have the right amount of ambition if you have zero prospects whatsoever. Um, you know, in order to exhibit courage for Aristotle, you needed to actually be able to go out on the battlefield, and that required having a suit of armor that uh, not everybody could afford. There's other ways of being courageous, of course, um, but here's the, the the long and short of it: the the life of contemplation doesn't really take that much. You don't have to have an awful lot of money. You don't have to have uh, you know, great prospects. You don't need to have a powerful position. You don't need to have family connections. As a matter of fact, this is even more true today given the resources available with the internet and the fact that in, in most you know, uh, urban centers and even in many rural areas, we have access to libraries all over the place. So that, you know, if we want to engage in a life of knowledge, it doesn't really require that much of us. You know, this book cost me, when I bought it years and years ago, about $20. I have gotten you know, 20 years of, of use out of this book. That's why it's in such you know, poor condition in many respects. Um, but you can tell that it's a well-loved book because of all the notes and because of the fact that I have dog-eared and underlined and written marginalia. Um, it doesn't take an awful lot to be a scholar. Now, you know, you might say, well, wait a second. What if we want to um, collide, you know, particles with each other and find out about the mysteries of the universe? Yeah, okay, now you need a budget for that sort of thing. But now you're involved with something that's not just the life of contemplation. Now you're involved with an entire industry involved with uh, what we do with the fruits of contemplation. And that's more like the political life than the, the purely contemplative life that Aristotle was talking about. Although that's worth keeping in mind. What else? Um, Aristotle suggests that there's some theological dimensions to this as well. This life is higher than a simply human life. It's higher to begin with than a, than a purely animal life. Animals have no share in contemplation, Aristotle argues, and for that reason can't be happy in that way. And animals also, Aristotle thinks, don't really have any share in virtue either, in part because they don't have the intellectual uh, part that we do in our, our soul or our minds. Um, but the purely human life is transcended by contemplation. We enter into something that is, Aristotle says, if not itself divine in the same way that the gods are, at least in some sense of participation in the divine. 
we're doing something like what the gods themselves do. And Aristotle says those who counsel that human beings should stick with merely human thoughts are wrong about this. Um, he goes on further a little bit later on and suggests that the person who pursues intellectual activity uh, and develops their intellect, who maintains it, who keeps it in good condition, is actually beloved by the gods. Why? Because that person has something in common with the gods that other people don't. The gods, you know, presumably are something like pure, pure intellects. Uh, they don't have bodies of our sort to drag them down into mundane earthly things, and they don't even exhibit virtues of the sort that we talk about as moral virtues like uh, courage. What do the gods have to be afraid of, right? Justice. It's not like the gods are engaging in contracts with each other, and he goes on and on. Whereas, um, you know, the gods, or the divine, or whatever it is that Aristotle's talking about here, they can see some sort of similarity between themselves and the person who is using the best and finest, and in a certain sense, not only most divine, but, but most human, part of ourselves. So all of these are arguments Aristotle provides for why the contemplative life, the theoretical life, the life of philosophy, is indeed the best life. 